everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this lecture this evening on culturally responsive music education. presentation I'm going to be going over four things here first of all what is culture uh, what is culturally responsive teaching and why is it important so I'll be giving you some definitions there and then I'll also let you know about a problem of practice that we have in uh, m instrumental music education regarding culture and then uh, I'll show you some examples of culturally responsive uh, music education programs and then I'll end this lecture with a performance of some culturally diver diverse composers repertoire uh, with brief program notes. So I want to start today uh, by just laying the groundwork here of what is culture, so that we're all on the same page, a good working definition of culture. Uh, there's a lot of definitions out there. I'm pulling this one from 1871. It goes way back. Uh, complex whole, which includes knowledge, belief, art, morals, law, custom, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by man or woman as a member of society. Now, if we look at the graphic on the right, this is from the Center for Culturally Responsive Teaching and Learning. And this was uh, designed by Dr. Shiraki Holly, who runs that program. And these are different rings of culture that are important that you understand about yourself and that you also understand about your students. So I'm gonna go through three definitions of culturally responsive teaching um, from when it started into where we are now. Um, they're all very similar. So first of all, it uh, emerged in the 1990s um, in a book called The Dream Keepers, Successful Teachers of African American Children. Now this doesn't have anything to do with music, um, but what uh, the author of this research paper, uh, Gloria Billings, she found, she wanted to know why are some black students underachieving and other ones are high achieving? And, and through all of her research, she found that the students that were high achieving, it was a lot to do with their teachers. Um, the teachers that had high achieving African American students, um, all those teachers had different styles of teaching and different methods of teaching, but they also shared some common traits. And those common traits is that the teachers valued the local community culture um, and they integrated themselves into that culture. Um, they appreciated the student's culture of origin while helping them develop fluency in another culture. And when we're talking about school, in academia, we're talking about academic culture. Um, and these teachers also help students develop critical perspectives to question the structures of the school. And this quote down here from her book, helps students to accept and affirm their cultural identity while developing critical perspectives that challenge inequities that schools perpetuate. So that's from the 90s. Then uh, in the year 2000, we have um, some more research and, and materials published regarding culturally responsive teaching, and here it's applied to many other ethnicities, not just African Americans. And um, from here, if we look at this diagram, you can see these four qu quadrants, um, bringing native language into the classroom, very important, understanding history and culture of your students, um, the community culture into the classroom, and so that's really understanding the community that you're living in as opposed to the one that you came from, and also getting the family involved. And if a teacher is doing those things that are culturally responsive, uh, that was the definition in 2000. Uh, another thing, um, since the beginning of culturally responsive teaching to now, there has been um, some research studies, some quantitative research studies to find out, is this really effective? And it is. Um, the data shows that students who have culturally responsive teachers have improved GPAs by 1.4 points. And there's a 21% improvement in attendance rates for students who have culturally responsive teachers. They also have improved uh, behavior and much more family engagement. So here's our most recent definition, the one we're working off of with uh, Dr. Hawley presented um, in his Center for Culturally Responsive Teaching and Learning, um, and he calls it VABB, V-A-B-B, Validate, Affirm, Build, and Bridge. And I'll be spending uh, this lecture today really talking about validating and affirming students, 
Um, but validating is to make legitimate that which the institution and mainstream media have made illegitimate. And affirming is to make positive that with the, which the institution of academia and mainstream media have made negative, right? So you're just trying to undo what society has done. So why do we need, well I already showed you it does improve students' academic success and their attendance rates and all that good stuff, but why do we need it in music? Well, we're gonna take a look at some demographics. This page here shows you, this is from 2020. There are three colors here. The dark blue is 2009. So you can compare ethnicities of students across the United States. Um, in this research study, it shows you that um, in 2020, which is the purple color, you can see the white students decreased in population. Um, the black students uh, decreased a little bit. Hispanic students, there was a rise. More Hispanic students in the classrooms in the last 10 years. The yellow bar is a projection of 2030. So you can kind of see the trend we're in. Um, and then over here are the numbers that go with the bar graph. So 46% of uh, United States classrooms are white and 28% are Hispanic. Now you think 28%, but that equals 13 million students. That's a lot of Hispanic students in our classrooms. Now, another study was done, this is great. Eighth graders who are enrolled in music performance. So this was um, a study done across the United States and there were 4,040 students surveyed and it turns out that 34% of them join music. They join music in eighth grade. And 55% of them are white. Now if we remember that last graphic, 46% of the population is white, but in band, 55% is white. So why are there more white kids in band? And why is the Hispanic population growing in the school, but shrinking in the band? Because there's less Hispanic students in band than there are in the school population. And you can see the numbers here for the other ethnicities, which are also greatly marginalized in band. So why are only 12% of black students joining band? 7% of Asian Pacific Islanders in band. 1% Native American, and you'll know why that's so low in a minute. All right. So this just shows you the difference that I was just mentioning. So the uh, turquoise blue color there, that's the 2020 demographics of the school classroom and the yellow is the band enrollment. So you can see the white students is greatly outnumbering all of the other ethnicities in band. Why? It's because of what is being taught in eighth grade band. Students aren't joining band because they don't identify with the culture. Um, beginning band method books lack cultural diversity. So um, a research study was done uh, looking at eight of the, or no, 11 of these books, and 85% of the music in these books is Western European classical music or American folk, which is derived from Europe. 6% um, of the songs were Hispanic, 1% African, and absolutely no representation of Native American music whatsoever. So if you wonder why aren't Native American students joining band, well, they don't see their culture there. They don't identify with what's happening in band. Well, what's happening in college? Well, sad to say the problem is still happening. Um, higher education perpetuates the marginalization, mar marginalization of underrepresented groups. So what you're looking at here is a chart from Philip Ewell's book called Music Theory and the White Racial Frame. And he analyzed all of these college textbooks, and I brought one here, Tonal Harmony, this is on the list. It's the one that has 29% of the market share. Um, this is the theory book that was required for me when I started my bachelor's degree in 1993. And it is the same book that the students are using right now at this college that I'm teaching at here at Merced College. Um, and so this is pretty much the standard music theory book for college students. Now, if we look at what's in this book, we can see that there are 370, whoa, I'm so bad at math, 
so sorry about that. Can you fix the pre presentation? Thank you. My clicker went crazy. Okay, if you look here at the Casca, Pain, and Almond, there, that's the, uh, the tonal harmony I've got. It says that there are 370 musical examples in the book. Okay. It's a lot of musical examples. Only 10 of them are, only 10 of them are by non-whites. So 360 pieces or examples are by white composers and 10 are by non-whites, which is 2.7% of the textbook. This is called structural racism. Structural racism is pervasive and deeply embedded laws, policies, practices, and beliefs. And these things produce, condone, and perpetuate the widespread unfair treatment of people of color. Now we'll take a quick look at the history of music education in the United States. From 1900 to 1940, there was a mission <coughs> to Americanize immigrant students and native students. And by Americanizing them, they required them to speak English. The music classes were only English songs. Um, was European folk music and patriotic music. So there was absolutely no music whatsoever of the students' home culture. And of course, we had segregation, segregation going on at that time as well. In 1943, the very first inclusive music textbook was published for first graders, and it included a few Mexican folk songs, like Sila Tildindo. Um, good news is for elementary music education, in 2023, it's very diverse. There's a lot of repertoire out there now for um, various ethnic cultures and their music, and it's all over the place in elementary music. Unfortunately, as I just showed you, in the band world, we're still in 1943, basically. So what are the consequences of structural racism? Well, um, there's all these studies now that you can find out. Recent bachelor's degree in music education. This is what we have. The study ran from 2011 to 2018. It was just published in, last year in 2022. And they found that of all the degrees issued for Bachelor of Music, 81% of those were white students. And if we come and look at over here, 90% of all music educators are white. So that's a problem. That's what structural racism call, causes, is that uh, BIPOC students, black, indigenous, people of color are devalued and marginalized in middle school band. They don't join band and of course they never make it to be a music teacher, which they certainly could. So how do we reduce the disproportionate representation of BIPOC students in music? Number one is to validate. So I'm going back to Dr. Holly's VAB, Validate, Affirm, Build, and Bridge. And to validate is to legitimize. The intentional and purposeful legitimization of the home culture and language of students. So you can't just keep teaching out of those same band books because there's not enough uh, diverse culture in there to reach all the students. So the answer is to include culturally diverse repertoire into the curriculum and create opportunities for the students to learn about that culture. Uh, because I want to make it clear, multicultural music education is including culturally diverse repertoire. But if you don't talk about that composer, where they're from, their culture, their beliefs, their traditions, then you're doing no service to the students who identify with that composer. So you really need to discuss the culture, learn about the culture, and have open dialogue with your students about the culture of the diverse composers. And to affirm is the intentional and purposeful effort to reverse the negative stereotypes of non-mainstream cultures and languages portrayed in historical perspectives. So this is all about learning who your students are and fostering a sense of belonging for them in the classroom and valuing their culture and uh, allowing for open dialogue. So really learning who they are. This is about a student-centered education and not a teacher-centered education. Teacher-centered education is when the teacher says, this is what we're gonna learn today, and you just tell them, and they're supposed to learn it. Student-centered uh, student education is where the teacher says, tell me something about yourself, and when you learn something about that child, then you decide how and what you'll be teaching them. 
So let's look at some examples of culturally responsive music programs. So this one is right outside of San Diego, Sweetwater High School. Um, they have a mariachi program. So the community down there in San Diego is 67% Hispanic student population at this school. And in 1995, they had a 20% dropout rate. The following year, in 96, they started a mariachi program, uh, district-wide. It was an after-school program, so not part of the school day. Um, and the students loved it. Ten years later, that dropout rate has been reduced to 6%. Um, and the students, uh, through interviews, said that they have more school pride, that they um, att had better attendance rates, they were motivated to go to school because they loved the mariachi band, so they wanted to go to school to do that. And it also created a bridge for the family to come into school. There was more family participation after the mariachi band was established. So that's a high school example. Let's take a look at a college example, uh, San Diego State. Because I actually thought after I uh, found out about Sweetwater, I was like, well, where are those kids going to college? I wonder if the, their closest college has the same situation, and it turns out they do. So San Diego State is the closest college to Sweetwater High School. And we're looking at, um, oh, I didn't put my number up there. This is recent data. I believe it's from 2018. Um, there were 30,000 undergraduates, 34% white, 34% Hispanic. This is just the demographic of the school, OK? So the white and Hispanic uh, populations are about equal. But then when we look at the Bachelor of Music degrees from San Diego State, uh, there were 60 graduates. Oh, there's the date, 2021. That is very recent. Look at the numbers there. They have 40% Hispanic music degrees. That's wonderful. Why? This is because we just learned that there's 80%, 81% white students getting college degrees in music, not Hispanic. So why is San Diego producing these numbers? And here's why. I took a look at their course schedule, their offerings. And yes, they have everything that every other college has, your typical band, choir, orchestra, music history, music theory, all the same stuff. But they also have these courses, music and culture, Mexican and Chicano music, African American music, Brazilian music and culture, indigenous women and the arts. So you can see that their course offerings is culturally responsive. They know who their students are and they're offering class to classes that value those students' heritage. So the conclusion is, culturally responsive music teachers validate and affirm all students in the classroom, including the white students, um, by understanding and appreciating cultural diversity and developing cultural competency. So that's the teacher doing a little bit of work, personal work on cultural competency. Um, knowing who your students are and where they come from, programming culturally relevant repertoire, creating learning opportunities that honor diverse musicians and composers, and maintaining a high expectation for all students to succeed. And that statement has to do with awareness of one's own implicit bias, because you may on some deep level think that a Hispanic student's not gonna be able to do what a white kid can do, so you're gonna require less of that student. And that has to go away. So all students have the same high expectation. Uh, I'll share with you a project I've been working on, um, and it's still in development, so that's why it says my DMA project and beyond. Um, so when I found out that the band books, you know, don't have any, almost any, uh, ethnically diverse material, I thought, well, we need to fix this problem. And so I've been working to try to develop materials for middle school band um, that's culturally diverse. And so I have this website called teachworldmusic.com. I just took some screenshots from it. Um, you're welcome to go visit if you're curious. But that's the cover of my, um, my online book I'm developing. And just to give you an example of what you're seeing in the center here. So this is my page I have for Chile, South American music. And you can see that students learn about the geography of Chile, they learn about the political history of Chile, the indigenous culture, and then customs and traditions in Chile. So it's not just about playing music from Chile, but learning about Chile. And then here is a screenshot of the score for the band, the beginning band. It's probably more of like an eighth grade band level. Um, 
traditional folk melody that I've arranged for concert band. And so I've done, I think, six or seven countries at this point, uh, and I will continue to grow this book to include many more cultures. And um, my goal for this page is to create uh, play-along, like melodies. So it would be an OER, an open educational resource, so middle school students can pull out their clarinet and go on and play with the backing track that's on there, like a music minus one situation. And at some point, I will edit the actual band parts and uh, publish it for sale uh, if somebody wants to actually play the arrangement I created. Okay, so at this point, I'll transition into my performances. I will um, give brief program notes and then perform some music by culturally diverse composers. And I need just a moment to wet my reed. Thank you. Mario, uh, Mauricio Murcia, he's from Colombia, um, and he, you can see, his, I'm not going to read all this to you, but he's a wonderful clarinet composer and arranger, and he uh, wrote a book of 50 clarinet etudes, all based on Colombian rhythms, and we're going to be listening to a pasillo, a Colombian rhythm, folk music from the Andean region, so I've included the map here so you can see where that is, it runs all along the east coast there. And um, this is really the kind of like the national anthem in a way of Ecuador. When they gained freedom from Spain or independence from Spain, the pasillo is the music that represents their freedom from Spain. And a pasillo blends a European waltz with indigenous styles. And uh, what you'll hear is a three, four time signature, three sections related by key, and typically a pasillo will have a relative major or minor in the middle section. And a typical ensemble for a pasillo is a guitar, bandola, and tipple. And what I have here, the graphic, is the hemiola that you'll hear in the music I play. And uh, I'm not sure if the clip will hear has, I think they do quarter note triplets. But it alternates, even though the time signature is 3-4, it's alternating between the duple or a simple subdivision and a compound subdivision. So you have ba 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 so that's going to be a common feature of the music. Yeah, go ahead and play a clip of that. of a pasillo. And what I'll play for you now is etude number one, the pasillo. Um, it's just for solo clarinet and there's some things you can see about it while I'm playing. <laughs> Thank you. 
the next composer is Jorge Montilla from Venezuela. He is currently the professor of clarinet at the University of Iowa, and he's a virtuoso, and he's a product of El Sistema, which is, if you don't know, it is a publicly funded music education program uh, in Venezuela. So they don't get music in the school system, it's outside the school system. Um, this piece is based on a Venezuelan folk music called a jaropo, and it means a party. And it's the national song and dance of Venezuela. And it blends, like the other one, aspects of European and Spanish qualities. And you can see um, the Spanish qualities that go into a jaropo is the fandango and the malagueña. Um, just like the other Latin piece, it's in 3-4 time signature with the hemiola, the same idea. And um, there are three distinct variants of Haropo by region in Venezuela. And the example that I have here for you is that last one, mandolin, harp, cuatro, and maracas. Take a quick listen to that. That's the sound of a haropo. And today I will be playing for you a piece called Clarimba for clarinet and marimba, written in 2017, commissioned by eight college clarinet professors and premiered in 2013. We're just going to play excerpts of this piece. Thank you. 
college, and I truly appreciate him jumping in here and playing marimba for me, because I couldn't find another marimba player, so thank you. in the um, 60s called Raga Music for Clarinet, and then in the 90s uh, wrote some more ragas for clarinet. I'll be playing the, the stuff he wrote in 1996. He also is responsible for helping to create the um, Indo-Jazz fusion, so Indian music and jazz music together. I almost don't even know them as a separate thing, right? Um, Indo-Jazz, so he established a group in 1965 uh, that helped establish that genre. It isn't a question of the music being jazz or Indian or classical. It is a thoroughly satisfying blend of ingredients into something genuinely new, original, and forward-looking. What's really wonderful about um, working on music of uh, living composers and composers who lived in the 20th century, 21st century, is that you can actually get footage of them speaking and talking and know what they're thinking. And so I actually have some um, uh, short clips here of John Mayer speaking. So this is John Mayer. He's going to talk to you about what a raga is. A raga, uh, in a way, you can think of it as like a, based on a scale, but it's a set of notes. You have ascending notes like a scale and descending notes, but they don't match. So you might go up one way and down a different way. And also a character of Indian mu music are the microtones, the shruti. So, you know, in Western music we have 12 notes. And in Indian music, they have uh, almost infin infinite notes because any um, pitch bend that you can hear with the ear, it's a possible note in Indian music. And because of all of those possibilities of microtones, it's theorized that there's over 35,000 possible ragas. Um, so let's go ahead and just hear what John has to say. Now, they say that 132 scales. But one particular instrument does not learn all the 132 scales. In fact, they have a lot of them. Two of them, two of them, two of them, and So, now, and we, we, they talk about Indian music being improvisation. Now, Indian music is disciplined improvisation. In as far as the notes of the scale go up in one way and they come down in another way. Let's say, for example, the Ragu Bhutan, if you say. The, the whole scale is. Yeah, so five notes going up, but you couldn't tell by the way he played it, right? There's a lot of um, ornamentation that goes into it. Okay, and then one more other short video here talking about the tanpura. So the tanpura provides a very distinct sound for Indian music. It's a musical drone, a consistent um, pitch or set of pitches that doesn't change. So there's no harmonic uh, chord progressions in Indian music. And um, the tanpura represents jiva, life eternal and infinite. Quick clip of that, please. There is one instrument in India which is called the tampura. You see, the tampura it provides that that canvas of Indian sound. Now let's play this on the piano with the tampura. See them play the tampura. Now listen to this. How the piano sounds like an Indian instrument. Thank you. Uh, oh, he was just going to mention Jeepa, which I already did. All right, so I am going to go ahead and play for you. If you'll fix that volume down to where it's supposed to be. I'm going to play Sargam for solo clarinet, written in the 1990s. 
I have 96 penciled into my music. Um, I guess that's when it was published, so we're not sure when it was written. Um, and the name came from the first four uh, syllables of the Indian scale, kind of like solfege. So sa, re, ga, and ma. And you mash those all together and you get sargam. And this entire work, sargam, is nine ragas. And each raga represents a different time of day. Um, I'm gonna play two ragas for you. Uh, raga number one, mala, basha, mala, I don't know how to say that, mala bashri, sorry. And um, the todi. And so the raga begins on an afternoon. And because I don't have a, access to a tempura player, I am going to use a pre-recorded tempura. No, no, I think if you go to the next one, that'll be fine. If you turn that down, thank you. Okay, sure. So this next one, I uh, also use a tanfura uh, plus a drum backing. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. 
so we're good. It's risky to do that on Zoom. Okay, the next composer is Sarah J. Kaufman from Switzerland, but the reason he's on my slide is not because he's from Switzerland. He's a Jewish composer. And so if we're thinking about those rings of culture, this would be the religion ring, right? To make sure that we're uh, touching base with all of those rings of culture. And um, he, at first he was, his career is embedded in TV and film, commercial music, but he saw a photograph um, of a boy um, from Warsaw who was being taken to a concentration camp and he had a revelation, you know, that boy could have been me. You know, I, I don't live there, I'm safe, but I'm Jewish. So he, once he realized um, that, he started writing Jewish music. He wanted to put his culture out there to promote his culture. Um, so I'll be playing, um, <coughs> oh, this is just an explanation of Klezmer, sorry. Klezmer, Vessel of Melody, that's the actual literal translation there, but it, er, the early term was used to talk about the professional Jewish mu musicians, but now it's just a genre, a Klezmer genre, okay? It's Jewish folk music. Uh, it originated in Eastern Europe, and it's used for, uh, used to be used for specific social functions, weddings and community celebrations, so there's a lot of dance music in the Klezmer genre. And then the also religious ceremonies, which you'll hear reflective, improvisatory style playing, which is called a doina. And now, I would like to welcome my pianist, Thank you. Julie. And we will play, thank you. We will play the Petite Sweet Klezmer. And, um, yeah, I think we can do it. Running low on time.
Okay, so the last three composers I have scheduled are uh, all women. So I have to mention this, throughout the entire history of music, Western music, classical music, um, women have been marginalized and devalued. Um, many times because they were servants to their husband and to their children, right? And so they're not having a career in music. And uh, I want to present to you Fernanda de Kroop. She is a French composer, and what's really fascinating about Fernanda de Kroop is that all of her compositions, she wrote 285 compositions in the early 20th century, they were all lost uh, because she sort of retired from music just to raise her children after the divorce, and then when she passed away, all her music went into a box, and it went into her granddaughter's attic. And um, a few years back, was it 2012, I think, a researcher, or somebody was at a saxophone convention, and they heard a piece they'd never heard before, went crazy for it, found out it was Fernanda de Kroek, couldn't find any information about her or the music, and so he ended up just contacting the family, and he went to France, and he was able to recover uh, her entire works um, from the granddaughter's attic, and also Fernanda's son had some of her music as well. So um, she was pretty prolific. She, for clarinet, she wrote a lot of um, clarinet and piano music. She did do one clarinet concerto and a lot of chamber music. She has organ music. She wrote for symphony orchestras. I mean, it's all in there. And what's amazing is that she went to the Paris Conservatory while Faure was the director there, and she was contemporaries with Hibert and Messiaen. These are names that are common names in um, the classical music world, but nobody knows Fernanda de Kroek, but she was right there with them. In fact, she won prizes at the conservatory in harmony, counterpoint, and fugue, and a piano accompaniment. So I'm really happy to present a work of hers that's been lost. Um, it's a beautiful piece, I hope you enjoy it. I have to swab, I have bubbles really bad. <laughs> Still, it's my G sharp key. It's full of water.
I didn't click to the slide for you. So that was a lullaby <laughs> in mixed meter with romantic lyric melody, light texture, pentatonic scales, and blue notes. All right, moving on. Now we shall visit uh, South Korea with Shanae Kim. Um, she's a piano and cello player, and she has degrees in both composition and church music. She has a passion for church music. I did a little research on what's out there by her, and she has over 50 arrangements of sacred works for strings and winds. Um, and so I will be playing for you today um, five variations on a Korean hymn for flute, clarinet, and piano. And I'd like to welcome my flutist to the stage, Liz Wolfrey. Thank you. And although this is based on a Protestant hymn, um, it does utilize a traditional Korean rhythm in the Final movement.
them, I am over time. Do you want me to keep going? Absolutely. Okay, <laughs> I have one more piece. One more piece. So the last piece on my program is a current living composer, Valerie Coleman. Uh, she's from Louisville, Kentucky, um, and, but she's living up in New York. She's a flutist and composer. Yeah, she's living up in New York because she's got two really important jobs. In uh, 2021, she was appointed as flute and composition professor at the Manus School of Music in New York. And then last year, she was appointed to the professor at the Manhattan School of Music. So uh, she's got two jobs in New York, two good jobs. Um, she's Grammy nominated for her flute playing. And she's founder of Imani Wins. And if you've never heard of Imani Wins, I would highly recommend that you all go out uh, and listen to it when you leave here. It's a woodwind quintet, uh, really high caliber, and they were together for 24 years. So there's a ton of music from that ensemble. And she is featured at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. So the piece I'm gonna play for you was written in 2014, Sonatine. Um, it is very dramatic. Uh, we were just discussing whether or not this was based on a 12-tone row uh, because it's not exactly tonal. So buckle your seatbelts. Uh, fast riffs, recurring motives, jazz and Afro-Cuban influences. You'll hear improvisatory style, uh, complex rhythms. It's harmonically dense. There's a lot of it. Let me uh, get this for you. 